All right, you guys, it's working. We're broadcasting live to multiple play, face, uh, Facebook platforms, Facebook pages, Facebook groups. My name is Mitch Jackson. This is the Legal Minds Mastermind Tuesday afternoon, West Coast evening, East Coast live video Q&A with special guest star, Bob Berg. Bob, give us a wave so everyone watching live because we have multiple, oh, he's got his mug right there. And Bob, how's your audio? How's your audio, Bob? I think it's pretty good. I can hear you. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, yes. I was setting you up so you could go ahead and give me a hard time again like you did before we went live. Let me share <laughs> with everyone a formal introduction of Bob Berg, and then we're going to uh, share some go-giver approaches for lawyers and other professionals that we can all immediately start using on social media, and then we'll open this up live for Q&A. Bob Berg is the co-author of the Go-Giver book series, including The Go-Giver and The Go-Giver Influencer, and author of Endless Referrals, and my favorite business people skills book of all time, and Bob knows this. I've used some of the information and approaches in this book to win multi-million dollar trial verdicts. I really have, and Bob, it's awesome. The book is Adversaries into Allies, one of my favorite books of all time. Bob is not paying me to say that. It's from the heart, and I really mean that. All of you law school students at the USC Gould School of Law, get Bob's book, Adversaries into Allies. It's that good. It's the people skills that will help you connect with opposing counsel, connect with your clients, and help you connect and win cases. It'll also help you on social media. Uh, Bob's also a highly sought after speaker for company and organizational conferences, and he was recently inducted into the National Speakers Hall of Fame. I watched that go down live on Facebook Live over the weekend not too long ago, so congratulations, Bob. That's pretty exciting. Um, Bob's Go-Giver Influencer Facebook Lives and his Go-Giver podcast are super popular. They're a must-do watch and listen to. You can watch Bob's shows on his Facebook Live program, which is over at the Berg Bob Facebook link. So when you're searching for Bob on Facebook, you can use his name, but I happen to know it's Berg Bob to get to his uh, Facebook page and also his website, which is Berg, B-U-R-G, dot com. So Bob, thanks for being on today. Really appreciate it. And thanks for sharing with our Legal Minds Mastermind. And let me just say, this is also being pushed to the Maximum Lawyers Facebook group headed up by uh, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. They've got a group of six, seven, eight hundred lawyers, Bob, where they share digital and social media tips, practice development tips. And so we've worked out an arrangement to them to share today with their group. So hi, everybody. Share your questions for Bob in the comments, and I'll try to get to them throughout the course of the show. Bob, thanks for being on today. Really appreciate it. My absolute pleasure, Mitch. You're a great guy. You know you're one of my favorite human beings, and I just appreciate your your kind words and inviting me to, to be a guest. So hi to everybody. Everyone say hi to Bob. Bob, way to Bob. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and Bob, you know, it's interesting because Bob does social right. You know, it's interesting. Whenever you reach out to Bob on social, he always uses your name. He always <laughs> spends the time to communicate back with you. He's doing it the right way, and I think, it's Bob, it's a great way uh, for professionals, for lawyers, doctors, uh, dentists, uh, accountants, uh, CEOs to embrace and use set social media to build their brands. And that's why we have you on today's show. I've got a book coming out, you guys, at the end of December. It's Social Media for Professionals. Bob was kind enough to contribute a chapter in the book. The title of the chapter in the book is The Go-Giver Way to Enriching Your Practice via social media, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Bob, let's start things off with what is the biggest mistake that you've watched professionals make when engaging and building their brand on social media? I think perhaps the, the biggest mistake, and it actually it, it's very intuitive, so it, it's not surprising at all for anyone, and that is thinking that the medium is there to just kind of show off your expertise in a way. And it seems like it should be, right? Because, you know, don't they want to do business with you because you know more than the other people and because, and, and really, it, that's not the reason they're going to do. That might be the logical reason at the end, but it's, it's not going to endear them to you when they feel they're being spoken at or that you're kind of broadcasting to them or just showing off what you know. As, as you know, Mitch, every part of my work I base on a 
very, very basic premise. And that is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And when we talk at people, we, we don't create the context for that no like and trust to take place. So rather than focusing on us and our expertise, we want to uh, move from what I call an I focus or me focus over to an other focus. I love that. And that's so powerful. And it's so challenging for some of us to do as professionals, Bob. You know, sure. A lot of us have type A personalities, and it's our it's our way or the highway. But I think, <laughs> but I think once people realize that if they embrace some of the principles and approaches that you share, uh, both online and offline, and in your books, that's where the magic happens on social media. You had a quote that I did not give at the top of the show that I'd like to share with our audience, and your quote is, and I think it's from one of your Go Giver Giver books: "Your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment." How much more are you give in value than you take in payment? And that's such a profound statement. That's just that's something that I think really works well on social media, Bob. And uh, I wanted to share that with our audience. So what's the secret? What's the secret for professionals to get over that hurdle to make it about adding value uh, to their audience and making their message all about their audience and not about them? Well, I think in a sense, it's understanding what influence is really all about. Uh, on a very, very basic level, influence can be defined as the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a, a specific goal, a certain goal. That's, by definition, that's influence. That's its definition. I don't believe that's the substance or the essence of influence. I believe the essence of influence is pull, pull as opposed to push. Uh, there's the old saying, how far can you push a rope? And of course, the answer is not, not very, at least not very fast or very effectively, which is why great influencers don't, don't push. You, you never hear people say, wow, that David or that Marianne, she is so influential. She has a lot of push with people. No, right? She sure is or he sure is pushy. Wow, we just want to no. know. Uh, they, they, they do the opposite. They have pull. It, influence is pull. It's an attraction. Great influencers attract people, first to themselves and then to their ideas. And the greatest ones, the ones we call the genuine influencers, they do this by, by understanding what I believe was Dale Carnegie's underlying premise in his classic How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this great, is where he great, wrote, great. yeah, and it's where he wrote, ultimately, people do things for their reasons not our reasons. So the genuine influencer, the effective influencer, they're constantly asking themselves questions to kind of check their direction, check their intent. So their questions become, how is what I'm asking this other person to do, how does it align with their goals, with their wants, their needs, their desires? How does what I want this other person to do, how does it align with their values. And when asking ourselves these questions thoughtfully, intelligently, uh, genuinely, uh, authentically, not as a way to manipulate or coerce or trick someone into doing what we want them to do, no, it, it, but as a way of building everyone in the process, now we've come a lot closer to earning that person's commitment. And, you know, when we say, the, the when we talk about in the original Go Giver book, the law of influence. Your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, there, there, this is not meant in a way to be self-sacrificial or, or a doormat or a martyr in any way, not at all. It simply means that, again, we understand that people are focused on themselves. They're like, you know, no one's going to do business with you because you have a quota to meet. Right. They're not going to do business with you because you need the money and they're not even going to do business with you because you're a really great person who believes in what you do. They're going to do business with you because they believe they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And this is where Sam, the mentor in that first story, said to Joe, the protege, to make your win all about the other person's win. Again, this goes back to that moving from an I focus to an 
other focus, looking to place their interests first, understanding that first it's the right way to do business, okay? It's also the most profitable way to do business. So I think, Bob, for some of us, that's easier said than done, right? Sure. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, and it's something that once I figured that out, and frankly, members in our Legal Minds Mastermind community, once they figured that out, I think they started to see change in their personal lives and their professional lives. But there may be some tools, there might be a, some approaches that you can share with us to, to, to enable us or give ourselves permission to do that. In other words, when a situation comes up, what do we look at or what should we do to flip that switch so that we're not thinking and doing and acting what's in our best interest, but in fact, we're actually trying to provide a service to our clients. We're trying to be a go-giver to our clients. Are there any tips that you can share? Yeah, it first begins with understanding why it's so much more beneficial to do that for yourself as well. Um, you know, for example, if, and, and let's just take the sales vernacular, okay? Um, when people have said, well, Bob, you know, I get this go-giver thing that, uh, you know, put their interests first, you're caring about them. Yeah, I can see that after I don't need the money anymore. But right now, I need to be bringing home the, I need to be making them. So then I, so, but what happens is, Mitch, that's based on a false premise. It, that's based on the premise that by thinking, by putting your own interests first, you're more likely to get the business from people. So I would say that if I'm the, that, let, that let's say um, you're the customer, and let's say we'll put in the sales process someone selling their legal services. You have someone in front of you, and you are the attorney, and you're presenting to this person as to why they should hire you and your firm, okay? But you really need the money. So let's forget this go-giver stuff, okay? You need the money. Your focus is on getting their money. And so you're approaching it in such a way that the energy behind it is, you know, you're saying what you need to say to get their business. You, yeah, you ask some questions, but when they answer, you're kind of interrupting, or if they're, they have an objection, you're defensive about it, because they're kind of standing in the way of your money, okay? Um, it, you know, with the, so yeah. everything you're doing comes across that way, and I would say to the person, are they more likely or less likely to retain your services? And most people will say, well, probably less likely. So I say, okay, now you're the same attorney, and you still need to, to put bread on the table. You still need to, to, to uh, get this client. But what you're going to do is you're not going to deny your self-interest, okay? You're, you're a human being. You are self-interested. Not you, but, I mean, any of us. We're, we're sure. human beings. We're self-interested creatures. That's how we've evolved over years. But that's how we survive, by being self right by uh, surviving. So, no, you're not going to deny your self-interest. But you're going to temporarily and willingly suspend it, okay? Like you go into a movie, a movie theater, right? And there's the term, uh, the willing suspension of disbelief. You go into the movie theater, you know you're paying to see this movie. You know what you're going to be seeing up there on a silver screen is not real, okay? When the credits come up, you're seeing the same actors that you've seen before. In fact, that's probably why you paid to go there, because there's an actor you like. Uh, if it's a James Bond movie, James Bond isn't really cracking a joke while a terrorist has a gun pointed at his head. I mean, it just it wouldn't happen. But you willingly suspend your disbelief. Why? So you can enjoy the show, so you can laugh at the funny parts and emote at the sad parts, and you can, and that, right? Okay. Right, so it's right. the same thing here. Yeah, you're a self-interested person, and that's okay. I mean, you're a human being. But we're going to suspend that because we know that by acting in a self-interested way, it's not going to help them, and it's not going to help us. So you're going to go in, and you're going to say, okay, now you're going to go in, and you're going to be focused totally on that person, okay? You're suspending your self-interest, not, not denying it, not throwing it away. You're going to ask questions because you know that what selling your legal services is really all about is discovering what that other person needs, wants, and desires, and communicating how you can help them get it. But to be able to do that, you first have to ask the questions and listen in order to discover that, right? And you're going to listen not just with your ears. You're not listening in order to speak. You're not giving them their two cents worth so you can get in your 10 cents worth. You're listening with your, your, 
your eyes and your whole posture and even with the back of your neck. I mean, you're putting your entire being into listening to this person and this person's feeling listened to and they're feeling understood. And as they share with you what they need now, only at this point can you connect the benefits of what you can bring them with what they are needing, wanting, and desiring. And now when it's time uh, to ask the question for them to elicit your services, now they feel a lot better about it because they know you, they like you, they trust you, they know you have their best interest at heart. And when you do this, are they more likely or less likely to do business with you? And you know the chances are much more likely than the first attorney who was so focused on themselves. We're here with Bob Berg, Hall of Fame speaker with the National Speaking Association, author of the Go-Giver series of books, author of my favorite book, Adversaries and Allies. Bob, you mentioned the word listening. Everyone underline, underline that word, active listening, watching body language, listening to what someone's saying and seeing whether or not their responses with body language is congruent to what they're trying to communicate. For those students over at the USC Gould School of Law, AJ Jackson, how you doing? I told AJ I would give her a shout out today. My daughter's a third year student. You didn't hi, want AJ. me to do that. She didn't want me to do that, but we went there. Everybody say hi to AJ. Wave your hands. Hi, hey, AJ. AJ. And our son Garrett's a freshman at USC, Bob. So hi, everybody. Hey, now Garrett. I'm in, now I'm in hot water because of that. But listening is so important and using open-ended questions to do just that. Bob, when creating content on social media, when when creating engaging, helpful, pithy, entertaining content on social media, how can we use these approaches to create the type of content that develops the know, like, and trust aspect of the relationship that we're talking about and also encourages a professional to listen to what's being communicated on social media? I think one of the things we want to do, Mitch, when we when we post, when, let's say we post a, a blog. Now, by the very nature of a blog, it is a broadcast, okay? It, it's you speaking. But what you can do, and the best bloggers do this, is they create a conversation through that, that post. They welcome conversation. They welcome other points of view. They welcome feedback. They welcome connecting with one another and sharing ideas. So yes, to a certain point, it, it begins with a broadcast, but everything about it is about is about engaging and about starting a conversation. And then, you know, when people do um, respond or reply or comment, make sure you reply to their comment, even if it's just thanking them for taking the time. And if it's something that they say that you don't agree with, you still thank them for taking the time and for their comment. And while uh, you know we we may or may not agree on all points, we certainly welcome the conversation and for you to discuss idea, you know that. And so the more you can do that, that's how you create community. It, it you know and engaging. And then Bob, that's something you're so good at. Even before we got to know each other uh, fairly well. I was amazed at how you engaged with me when I reached out to you on social media. And I've seen you do that with other members in the Legal Minds Mastermind uh, who you've connected with. It's impressive, it's meaningful, it's something that lasts you know, a long time. And as a professional out there, if you spend the time to, to genuinely engage with your audience uh, and not instruct, not lecture, but listen and help and encourage, I think that's where the rapport and the bond oftentimes happen. At least that's what I see in the courtroom. Bob, with respect to, to content on social media, what type of, maybe you can give us a couple of different examples of how you see or could imagine professionals engaging on social media to accomplish all of the different goals that you've already shared with us today. Well, I think before every time you post and every time you, you tweet or any time you, whatever other, other verb is for the various social media out there, is you ask yourself the same basic question as you would if you're talking to somebody IRL in real life. And that is, is what I'm about to post, tweet, say, what have you, is it something that's going to add value to another human being? Is it something that's going to build someone up or is it going to tear someone down? Is it something that's going to bring value or is it something that's going to be meaningless? Is it something that's going to make a difference or something that, and so I, I think we, we can do that with, with anything we say, do, post, tweet, what have you. Now, uh, let's say you, um, and you and I discussed this once, that 
uh, let's say a, 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 a new law was being enacted, okay, uh, mm -hmm. you might put that out there as a, as a tweet or as a, a post just to say, you know, for those of you who have a whatever their type of corporation is, uh, please, uh, you know, just know that it looks like law so-and-so, so-and-so, which is going to incur a whatever, you know, has been enacted. Boom. And so you start, you know, you start from there. And now someone's going to probably respond or reply or, or ask a question. They may be your client. They may be somebody that who, who doesn't, and, you know, you put a hashtag there that will attract the people who might be interested in that or someone has retweeted that to someone who you don't yet know and they don't yet know, like, and trust you. But they may make a comment such as, oh, no, I'm really stuck. I haven't so-and-so. And then you might now comment back. Uh, oh, no fear in that regard, just blah, 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 or ask your attorney to blah, 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 you know, what have you. So you're, you're simply providing great value-based information without the presumption or the attachment that that's going to necessarily lead to business. Not that you don't want it. Of course you do. You're a human being. But you're, you're, you're providing the right information because it's the right way to, to be and the right thing to do. There's nothing self-sacrificial about it. This is how you're establishing your brand. This is Absolutely. how you're being positioned. This is how you're being positioned as the expert. So, so our members in the Legal Minds Mastermind are doing a great job at what you just said. The problem I see, Bob, and the reason you saw me start to get ex excited is I often see professionals, a lot of lawyers and doctors, talking about great question, call me and set up an appointment at my office. My hourly rate is X amount per hour. I'd be happy to answer your question. And, and, and it's like it's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. When you add value, when you answer questions, when you share your years of experience in a way where you're complying with state bar rules, for example, um, you're, you're, you're getting the audience member going in the right direction without compromising the rules of ethics or creating mm -hmm. a malpractice situation. There's a, there is a way to do that. And what happens is your audience, not only the person who you're communicating with, but your audience in general, people that, that you don't even know are out there watching what's going on, they're starting to know you, they're starting to like you, and they're starting to trust you because you're that professional that's offered to help and in fact did help without any expectation yeah. of receiving something in return. Now I will tell you, the business side of me is I'm building a brand, I'm building a company, and that when it's all said and done, it's about profits, right? I mean, I get that. But what you're talking about is a journey and a digital dance is what I would like, like to refer to it to, that builds trust, that builds relationships, and it ends up bringing in business, for example, to a law firm. Yeah, you know, Mitch, absolutely, not only is it good to make a profit, it's fantastic to make a profit, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's not that that's um, an issue in the, you know, in the original book, Joe said to, to Pindar, when Pindar was telling him, Joe said, are you saying asking if something will make money isn't a good question? Pindar said, no, asking if something will make money is a great question. It's just a bad first question. Right. First ask, mm -hmm. does it serve? Does it add value? Does it bring value? Because if it doesn't, people aren't going to do business with you. And so if you lead with, with, with the money in mind, that's how you're going to communicate that you're doing it. And again, they're not doing business with you because you need the money. And so this is why we say that money is an echo of value. Okay, money is an echo of value. It's the thunder to values lightning, which means nothing more that when the focus is on bringing value to others, that's when you begin the process of receiving. That's when you create what we call that benevolent context for success. Because as, you're, as you said, everyone's watching you. Everyone's seeing what you're doing. You're the person who has the value. You're sharing that value uh, very well. And you're putting that. So no, that's, that's what's going to lead to that money. And it's not as though it takes longer doing it that way. It takes shorter doing it that way. Because if you're the person who's just saying to everybody, uh, if you want to know more, call me at five, you know, blah, 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 my fee is this, they're not biting. They're not you know, going for that. So instead, you know, focus on bringing value and then you you need to be able to receive <laughs> and allow yourself to receive the profit. Absolutely. So you shared an important tip in the chapter that you, that you contributed to my book. 
And an example you used was, the example you just shared was, for example, I share a post about a new law or about a new case, something that affects consumer rights, for example. I initiated that post. But you also shared a very good example, and I think it was on Twitter, is if I, as a lawyer, see somebody tweeting out something, and I can easily get them going in the right direction. You shared, I think, four or five different steps or things to take into consideration for a professional when responding to that tweet, whether it's a tweet, it's a post, yeah. maybe it's a live stream. Can you, can you maybe elaborate just a little bit more? If we didn't initiate the post, but we wanna add value to someone's lives, what are some of the other things we might wanna think about? Sure, well, uh, I think this was when someone had a, a, a question and you maybe saw it because in the search, um, is that what it's called? You know, the search aspect, you, you know, keywords. So that exactly. they're gonna see when something like comes up. Like tagging or keywords uh, exactly. or something like that. And so somehow you come across and you see that and and you answer that question and a conversation starts and you know, you're positioned as the expert. And again, you're just giving away that ad ad advice and, and it's just beautiful and people love how you're doing it. So so it, and I, I printed this out so I can see it because I didn't want it because we were talking about the re results and I said, you know, don't suggest that they call you, like you were saying, don't suggest they call you to retain your services, at, not at this point, that maybe comes later when, there's, when it gets to a certain point where it's gone down the line, but prepare yourself for several possibilities, including the following. Yes. Number one, nothing will result at all, okay? That, that happens a lot of times. Number two, yeah. the person will thank you, that's fine. Three, others will have seen your helpful tweet and taken notice of your caring and expertise and perhaps follow you, giving you the opportunity to engage more where you can develop the know, like, and trust with that person. Four, this person will tweet you back another question which you'll respond to and eventually perhaps set up an appointment because there will be a certain point where you need to meet in order to be able to fully, you know, when it gets to that, that point. Five, you begin a group back and forth with you positioned as the expert and most likely gather new followers who are now potential clients. Or number six, several of the above, which is usually what happens. One of the things I suggest to people that, and this is also when you're in, let's say an exchange where you disagree with someone, Okay, do we ever see that on social media? I'm not sure. I don't know, sure. anybody here in the group, raise your hand if you ever disagree with anybody and on social media. Honestly, honesty and being truthful is very important, you guys. And so, <laughs> yeah. so, so that's what, what happens, happens when you have a lot of times lawyers. is you've got people who are arguing with each other back and forth because each one you know, wants to be right and both people feel they are right, but it ends up getting personal. And now, especially on, with social media, it's become much more socially acceptable that it gets personal, it gets vitriolic, it gets, right? But here's the thing. First of all, not only is that not an effective way to persuade someone to your side of the issue, even if you're never gonna persuade that person to your side of the issue, here's what we need to remember. This is so important. For every one-on-one -on -one conversation or debate you think you're in, there are 30 to 40 to 50 people who are lurking, okay? And here's what they're looking at, two basic things in terms of being persuaded to a certain uh, argument one way or the other. One is who has the logical facts, that's important, but that's only second, secondly important. The first is who do they like more? Who comes across in a way that they relate to? So are you, when you disagree with that other person while they're being vitriolic, are you being respectful? Are you thanking them for sharing their point of view? Are you expressing that you can tell uh, that they're very passionate about this and that you respect that? Uh, you know, I think our disagreement comes more with how we would blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? And I so guess. when you are that person, now that's, you become a, a lot more influential in the minds of those who are lurking and just watching and observing. For all the trial lawyers out there watching the live or recorded version of this, this live video, that works in court too. Oftentimes the jury is looking for a leader in the courtroom, somebody to take them by the hand and take them on a journey to help them find justice, to help them find a, a fair and reasonable outcome to a dispute. It's not always about who knows the facts the best. It's not always about who knows the law the best or the evidence or the rules of civil procedure. They're looking for someone to help right a wrong and come to a just and fair conclusion. 
Bob, that's so important what you just said. It's it's about relationships, right? And, and I know that at the end of the chapter that you shared in my book, you talked about the importance of professionals building relationships on social media. And why don't we, before we open this up for general Q&A, can you share a little bit about that, about why you concluded your chapter in my book about relationships and why professionals need to focus on that, that important issue? You know, Mitch, really, it's nothing more than that it all begins and ends with relationships. And, and we may want to look at it as though, well, that's not really the whole thing. You know what? It, it tends to come right down to that. <laughs> you know? It's all said and done, right? And, you know, it's interesting, in, in Stephen M. R. Covey's, uh, the, he's the son of Stephen Covey, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Stephen M. R. Covey wrote one of my favorite books of all time called The Speed of Trust. And the premise is that trust is the one thing that changes everything. And he talks about, you know, when there's high trust, things go quick, things go fast, right? When there's low trust or no trust or a lack of trust, that's when bureaucracy sets in. That's when the works get gummed up. That's when it needs to be, right? And he's, he calls it a, a, uh, a low trust tax that we pay. And one of the things he said is, tr is trust, he said this in the introduction, trust is the very root and source of your influence. So we think about you know how we define trust early, our influence, influence as on a, a basic definition level, the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action. Obviously, you're trying to move a jury to a, a desired decision, or if you're negotiating with someone, trying to move them to a desired, right? That's, right. In, that's influence, okay? Trust is at the very root and source of your influence. Trust is part of the know, like, and trust aspect of relationship. And it's probably the most important thing of all. So in the end, it's all about the relationship. I remember when I started practicing 32 years ago, a very well-known criminal defense attorney in town, Bob, who represents a lot of the judges in town, told me when I had a question for him on an issue I was dealing with, he said, Mitch, the most important asset you have in this town is your reputation. So whatever decision you make, make sure it's the right decision and understand what how important your long-term reputation is. I think on social media, Bob, what you just shared is so important for everyone watching in Legal Minds and the Maximum Lawyer Facebook group and everywhere, everywhere else on social media. It's so easy on social media with one tweet, one post, one comment, one exchange to completely destroy your trust oh. and reputation, right? Unlike the old, the I was around before the internet, before social media, and you had to work at it yeah. oftentimes to ruin your reputation. Yeah, exactly. Today it can happen in 10 or 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if you don't mind, before I open this up, you guys for Q&A, which I wanna do in about five minutes, if you guys have questions over at Legal Minds, ask them in the comments. If you have questions in Maximum Lawyer, ask them in the comments. Obviously, everyone here has priority. When I open it up, raise your hand and I'll get you guys on to say hi to Bob and ask your question. Um, when it's all said and done, Bob, maybe a couple of filtering buffer uh, suggestions before responding on social media in a way that may harm trust may affect your reputation with your clients, with your referral sources, with respect to your business company or profession. Uh, what do you think? Just maybe pause, take a deep breath, and give some thought to what may be some of the principles you share in the adversaries and the allies. And if you can go through those principles quickly, I'd really appreciate it. They're valuable. Sure. Well, it's funny. I mean, I don't I want to put you on the spot. To, uh, so, no, it's okay. I was just about to start with the first one. I was just about to mention that is control your emotions. Okay. Uh, you know, it all begins there. The you know the sages asked, "Who is a mighty person?" and answered, "That person who can control their own emotions and make of an enemy or of a potential enemy a friend." This is where it begins because it's only when we're in control of our emotions that we're even in a position to take a potentially negative situation or person and turn it into a win for everyone involved. Uh, you know, we we all I say all most of us respect that person who keeps their head about them, right? Who is control in control of themselves, who doesn't get flustered and doesn't get, right? And so we know this, and yet, how often do we allow what someone else says or does to push our emotional hot button? And we, we allow ourselves to become 
frustrated or, or upset or angry, and we say or do something that we know is absolutely counterproductive to our goals, right? And yeah. the, you know, the question, well, why do we do that? And the answer is because we're human beings. And as human beings, we are emotional creatures. Uh, we'd like to think we're logical, and to a certain extent, of course, we are, but we're pretty emotionally driven. We make major decisions based on emotion, and we back up those emotional decisions with logic. We rationalize, we, which simply means we tell ourselves rational lies. And we do that to justify those emotion-based decisions that we know we shouldn't have, have made. So what we don't, what we're not saying, just like earlier when I said we're not saying to, to deny your self-interest, right? We're not saying deny your emotions. We're not saying forego your emotions. There's no reason to. Emotions are a wonderful part of life. They bring us joy. They make it worthwhile. What we are saying is make sure that you are the master of your emotions rather than your emotions being the master of you. Or as one of my great friends, Dondi Sumachi, I, I think you know Dondi Mitch, she says, take your emotions along for the ride, but make sure you are driving the car. I love so, that. That is such a powerful statement. And uh, for those of us in the group, you guys, like Nicole, who congratulations, she's been, she's a newly engaged uh, uh, professional. What Bob just shared works in the courtroom and it works at home also, right, Bob? A lot of these people skills work in and out of the office, so keep that in mind. Jillian, Nick, Annika, Julie, Layla, Allison, Bernard, here on the live video, we have about a dozen people watching who are not on the screen right now, and then we have probably another 100 or so on the different Facebook groups. So powerful, and I always like to separate the people from the problem, and Bob, I honestly don't know if I read that in one of your books or someplace else, but you know, it's like be tough on issues and kind to people. And when you do that as a lawyer, as a professional, it really does help you eliminate the emotion aspect of building a good solid relationship. And once I figured that out, everything else kind of fell into place. A lot of times, Bob, we get a phone call and somebody's yelling and screaming about something that really in the scheme of, of life isn't that important. And it's so easy to play that game and drop gloves and just go right back at them, which most lawyers do. Uh, young lawyers out there, don't fall into that trap. Take a deep breath, take a step back. Maybe ask them something like, are you having a bad day? Or what can I do to make your day better? And depending on how you sell that statement, it really can lighten up the whole situation and, and help with a very, very good long-term, uh, mutually win-win type of situation. Bob, also you talked about understand the clash of belief systems. Yeah. in your book, Adversaries into Allies. Let's go through the remaining four steps. There's five principles that I want to share, but I do want to open this up for Q&A, so I don't want to rush you, I'll but do I do need to rush digest, you. I'll, I'll do it the Reader's Digest, okay. uh, registered trademark after Reader's Digest. I uh, love it. I love it. You're, um, you're safe. You're safe with all these <laughs> So the clash of belief systems, it simply means this real. I mean, what is a belief? A belief is a subjective truth. It's the truth as we understand the truth to be, which means it might be the truth or it might not be. And many times what we believe is the truth isn't necessarily the truth, but we, the reason why is because we all come from a different, different belief systems, right? Our, our, our different ways of seeing the world. Uh, our belief system is a combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, news media, television shows, movies, popular culture, cultural morts, everything. But it, it, it's, it's sort of developed by the time we're a little more than toddlers, and it's pretty much etched in stone. And as we grow up, and, as, and most people live their lives, um, really subject to an unconscious operating system. They don't even realize that these are, are beliefs through which they live their lives, and it's not really free choice because these have been programmed in. And unless yeah. we know this and we're conscious of this, we don't know it. Now, here's the thing. As human beings, not only are we subject to the, this unconscious operating system, our beliefs, um, but so is the other person. But as human beings, we tend to believe that the way we see the world is the same way everyone else sees the world. Now, that's very intuitive, right? Because it's all we know. How could it be any different? And so what happens is that way, mo most, um, not argue, although arguments, but most conflict 
is the result of two people seeing the same basic thing from two different viewpoints. Neither of them realizing that each that the other person is seeing it from an entirely different premise, okay, or belief system. So what we need to do is not understand that other person's beliefs. We we can't necessarily they don't even understand their their beliefs. We just need to be aware that there is a clash of belief systems at work. At that point, now we can respectfully ask the correct questions to determine what it is they really need. You know, in the, in the newest, in the uh, go-giver influencer for belief systems, we say, step into the other person's shoes, which sounds easy until you realize that most of us have different size feet. So literally, <laughs> we can't step into their shoes. Good. Figuratively, we can't step into their minds. We can't know what they're thinking. And that's why we've got to be willing to explore and ask and listen respectfully because only then can we then approach the situation understanding what they're even thinking. Bob, I walked out of a trial into an elevator and the gentleman in the elevator, uh, I was a little bit worried about standing next to, it was just he and I, seven floors from the seventh floor down to the ground floor. He was upset, looked like he was ready to cry, looked like he was ready to hit me, very concerned, I thought he was unstable. The elevator doors opened and it was the news media. And as it turned out, he was the brother of somebody who was murdered in a high prof profile murder case. And the verdict had just come back guilty. So the person that murdered his sister was going to jail for life. Okay, it was a tragic case. I walked away from that experience thinking to myself, wow, did I totally misjudge what was going on? My perception, my belief system. Sure as sure. to the environment was so far off base. And I learned from that for the rest of my life. I thought to myself, I don't want to prejudge a situation. Mm -hmm. You know, learn the facts before you make a judgment on somebody. And, and so when it happens to you, that's where it really hits home, right? That's where right. it really gets ingrained into your system, your soul mm -hmm. and everything else. Um, acknowledge their ego. Egos well, this, are a funny thing, right? This is simply understanding that Mitch, when it comes right down to it, in terms of influence, in terms of persuasion, 95% of it is how you make that other person feel about themselves, and as a result, how they feel about you. And this is why we have to understand human nature, we have to respect human nature, and we always have to look at how we can, it always comes down to bringing value to that other person. There are ways to say things and there are other ways to say things and some of them are very productive and edify and build and other things can be hurtful and harmful and you can get the same basic point across but one way you say it in a way that is uplifting and makes everyone feel good about themselves or there's the opposite choice and that's really and we need to understand that ego will come into play um, and so we, we've got to understand that. You share a quote about somebody with a hole in their head. Do you know that quote off the top? Yeah, of and it's not my quote, but I quoted them in the book. Right. But it's it's tact is being able to tell someone they really have an open mind when what they have is a hole in their head or something like that. It, it yeah, it, I love uh, it. They're, they're, yeah. There's some great. I, I love uh, that. But I'll tell you what. You know what quote about tact I love the most? The one my dad always taught me growing up, and this is from my dad. His definition. He always defined tact as the language of strength. And mm. to me, that really is what it's about because it takes a strong person to not just react to what someone else says or does, right? It, it takes a strong person to be able to uh, think first and consider what you're gonna say first and how you're gonna say it and how it's going to affect that other, that other person. And understanding that really does roll into the fourth principle in adversaries into allies, which is set the proper frame. When we're negotiating as professionals, whether we're negotiating a, a bill with our client or an hourly rate, whether we're negotiating a case as a lawyer in a mediation and, or an arbitration, um, understanding what the, what the proper frames are. The frame is so important. So uh, important. What, what is a frame? Well, a frame is the foundation from which <clears throat> everything else evolves, okay? So if you set the proper frame or sometimes reset someone else's negative uh, set frame, if, if you create the proper frame, you're 80 to 90% of the way there to 
what you want to do. Can I share my favorite frame story with you? And it has absolutely, absolutely nothing to do with business. Absolutely. Uh, I was at a, this is several years ago. Uh, I was at a Dunkin' Donuts restaurant and there was a little boy, a toddler, probably two, two and a half years old. He's running around the restaurant and his parents call him, <clears throat> excuse me, back over to the table. He starts to walk over when all of a sudden he just takes a spill on the floor. He, he falls. He didn't hurt himself, but you could tell he was shocked. He was surprised. This was not in his realm of experience. So immediately he looks at his mom and dad, the two people he trusts most in the world, to get their um, interpretation of this event. <laughs> right Now, I truly believe that had the mom and dad gotten upset and panicky and, oh, no, my baby, are you okay? He'd have started to cry. But they handled it so beautifully. They, they walked over quickly but very calmly. They smiled. Uh, they applauded. They laughed. They said, oh, how fun. What a good trick. Oh, you know, and immediately he began to laugh. Now, what the parents did is they set a productive frame from which he could operate. And that's what we need to keep in mind. It, it always begins with the frame. And when that other person comes, the person you were talking about who called in really upset, well, they've come in with an upset frame. If you react to that and play into that, buy into that frame, now you're arguing back with them and they're arguing that they're, instead, let's set the frame, let's reset the frame. You know what, it sounds like you're really upset about something and I just wanna let you know uh, I'm here to help you in any way I can, or, you know, did you, I, however you, you, you might say it. Um, and so a good way to do that is to rehearse that happening. If you ever have a situation where you get calls from people who are really angry, well, it's happened before. It's going to happen again. Okay. So instead of just reacting to that and buying into that frame, rehearse in your mind what you're going to do the next time. OK, and and see that playing out. And just like an astronaut, before they go up into space on a mission, he or she will do hundreds of simulations. Why? Because when they finally get up there into space and something, God forbid, happens, they've already been there. They've done that. They can. Right. They know exactly what to do. I say, well, it's not the same being in space. Well, it's pretty close. It's close enough because we know that the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind can't differentiate between what has actually happened and what has been suggested to it over and over again. So if you will play through this person calling angrily or one of the many other situations that happens that you find yourself emotionally reacting to, instead start retraining your brain and reset the frame so that now you know exactly what you're going to say or at least the foundation from what you're going to say for what you're going to say and you'll be amazed within a couple of weeks of doing this there'll be a, a huge change as professionals one of the basic things we have to do is close a new deal with a client or a patient when they, they have plenty of options out there mm -hmm. and what you just described is oftentimes we get the same objections Sure. To a new client sitting across from my desk, your rates are too high, it's going to take too long, I can do this on my own. If you prepare ahead of time for the right type of response, understanding who you're speaking to, what are the dynamics, all the things we talked about, you can prepare and plan ahead of time to give the type of, type of response that's going exactly. to build trust in your potential client that was, will result in him or her becoming your client or patient. That's so important. And your fifth principle, Bob, has to do with communication. And I think that's yeah. where you and I connect. It is, is uh, it has to do with understanding all of the other principles and then applying them when you're communicating yeah. with the third exactly. party, right? Because that's what brings it home. Because you can do all the other things and it's great, but you've got to be able to, and this is where tact comes in. It's also where empathy comes in. And empathy, which literally, dictionary definition again, is simply the identification with or vicarious experiencing of another person's feelings. Well, again, just like the, the shoes, we don't necessarily know how they feel, okay? because we're not them, uh, but we can communicate that we understand they're feeling something and that this something is distressful to them and that we're here to help. Let's go back to your example about, uh, you know, this person who's in front of you and you're trying to, to, uh, to have them retain your services. Well, remember, you're giving them information that, that as an attorney, you do all the time, okay? 
to them, how many people need an attorney all the time? Most people don't, some, some, but most don't. The average person comes in, not because they really want to be there, but something has happened in their life that they, right? And right. so we, if we're empathetic, we don't necessarily know how they feel because we don't feel that way, right? But we understand they're feeling something. Now we can, with an I message, which basically takes the onus off of them and puts it onto us, we can say, you know, I, I feel as though you're uncomfortable with some of the things that we're discussing. And I just wanna let you know that's very, very natural. You know, this is something I do all the time, but I realize for you, it's just, you know, it's not. It's something really new for you and maybe uncomfortable. And I just wanna let you know that is part of my job. I'm here to help you with what you, you know? So when we do that, now we're creating a safe space with that empathy so they feel good about themselves, they feel good about us, and they feel they can ask that question. It's all about feelings and emotions sometimes. You don't have to overcomplicate it. It's the know, like, and trust. Let's do quick, rapid fire Q&A, you guys. Unmute your mics if you guys have a question for, for Bob. Uh, Bob Berg, author of the Go-Giver series of books, my favorite book, Adversaries and Allies. Okay, thank you. Who's got a question for Bob? Who wants to say it? Bernard, you're up. Hey, Bernard. Bob, thank you for such awesome information tonight. Thank you. Uh, you try to keep your emotions in check. You're having a discussion on Twitter, and you say the wrong thing. You can always delete, but it never goes away. How do you clean that up? How do you gain back the trust when you screwed up? You know what? One of the things, Bernard, is to be quick to apologize. You know, and apologize without excuse. You can give a reason that's a factual reason, but without an excuse and without, uh, you know, trying to do a, you know, a cover up -y type of thing. So really, you know, we all do that from time to time. We either say something the wrong way or we say, uh, or we misstate something. So when you can very quickly apologize, that's about the best you can do. And most people are going to be able to accept that. Now, the ones who don't, they're probably looking for a reason to not accept anything anyway. So, but, but most people remember the other people who are watching and lurking, <laughs> even if that person, but the chances are also that person will be fine with it. You know, I've had discussions where I may have uh, said to this person something like, well, I remember you said so-and-so, so-and-so, but because the conversation was very polite and respectful, when they wrote back and said, well, no, I actually didn't say that, I said, but, so of course I went back through some things to check and they were right. And I said, you're absolutely right. You didn't say it. I interpreted that way. My apologies. You know, and so when you do that, you know, now you're really, you're almost taking it up to another level. So you're turning that kind of mistake into something that's actually a positive. Raise your hand if you have a question for Bob and just unmute. Go for it. Annika. Um, I was just wondering what yeah. your most inspiring or um, one of the most drastic changes you've ever seen in a professional who's kind of adopted your your theories. Like I think one there were two. Stuck out to you. No, I think there were two types of of people who, by and large, who really adapt the principles in the uh, in the books. There's the person who already was doing it this way. You know, that's a Mitch Jackson, okay? I mean, Mitch is the embodiment of someone who, who lives his life and conducts business this way anyway. And those were actually the, the early adapters, the first adapters of the book who told others. Then there were the ones who this kind of was something so totally different from what they were doing before that when they had the, the results, it was, wow, I really didn't know that you could do things this way and have, and those, you know, we enjoy hearing from both people, both types, but there's a special kind of feeling when it's someone who, and, they, and a lot of times they said, this book was referred by, you know, someone else who had already, you know, so, so I, I think, yeah, I mean, those kind of things happen. We've been very fortunate to, to receive a lot of those kind of love letters from people like that. And I'll tell you, we never get tired of those. It, it's always a thrill. I can imagine. Great, great question, Annika. You know, Bob, it's interesting. Great. I'm looking at everybody here, and there's a book here. Your next book is right here in front of us, and I really do mean that. You, we've got some people. Annika is doing amazing community-based marketing where the firms and the clients of hers are going into the community, 
and doing things to help the community. Okay, and then they're sharing it on social and it's done in the right way. And there's a book there. Uh, Jillian was talking about water safety uh, this past summer with her family and she's having her kids share different water safety tips while down on the sand at the beach. From a lawyer's perspective, that's so different, that's so new. Nick Rishwain's news jacking through experts.com breaking news stories that are amazing. Allison's a criminal defense attorney. Raise your wave, Allison, so Bob can see you, who's on Instagram just sharing short little pithy criminal defense tips. If you've been Wonderful. arrested, and it's just so powerful. Mm -hmm. Layla's doing amazing things, Nicole, and it's like, there's a book here, you guys. Yeah. Okay, all Absolutely. of you need to reach out to Bob. Julie, I mean, you're, 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 you're diving into social media, you're tearing it up. I love some of the personal stories that you're sharing. Bob, if, if our members would like to reach out to you or people watching on the other Facebook pages who I haven't been able to bring in their questions because we just haven't had enough time. By the way, Professor Nicholas Meir of Chapman University told me to tell you hi. I don't know if you know Nicholas, but he's a big fan and he teaches wow. social media marketing here in Orange County, California. Thank How you. can everybody connect with you? How can they reach out to you? We have one gentleman in one of the groups that was holding up your endless referral books and he needs it <laughs> autographed, he said. How can people <laughs> reach out to you to do all the above? That was actually the endless referrals book. I mean, endless uh, referrals, that's all. Yeah. No, that's what you said. Yeah, I, th I think that's what you said. That was, that was, and that was my first kind of big book. That was a how-to book. And we had a lot of lawyers using that. That was back in the day when, when you came into a law firm, you weren't, you, you didn't have to make rain right away because the partners were doing that. They just wanted you to do, but as things started to shift and the associates began to use endless referrals, a lot of them were building their practice that way. So uh, that, that's really fun to hear someone mention. Uh, he wants an autograph. So how can, how can everybody <laughs> can connect with you? Yeah, the best way is just to either go to thegogiver.com uh, without the hyphen, thegogiver.com. There's lots of resources there you can check out, including the books where you can get a couple of chapters first to see if you like them, then click through. Uh, or you can go to berg, B -U -R -G .com, and both will just take you to different aspects. But I'm all over, over social media in, in various places, so sure. And by the way, uh, Mitch, uh, speaking of newsjacking, that was great when uh, David Merriman Scott was doing one of the uh, general sessions at the National Speakers Association convention this summer, and he highlighted you from on stage, had you up there on the screen, and uh, and uh, wow. utilized you as a, a prime example of someone who was doing it right. So that was quite a that was quite I'm a thrill sorry. for me to. To, to say, I, yeah, I, didn't, hear, I didn't hear any of that. Can you repeat everything you just said? Now? <laughs> yeah, no. David's a great guy, and he's actually a friend, a friend of the community. And Bob, thank you for sharing that. Bob, thank you for your for your time and for sharing the tips. And did everybody enjoy this? Did, was that cool, you guys? That was so awesome. Um, so Bob, listen, I want you to know that we're all always here for you. Um, thank you for sharing the go-giver approach uh, with all of us, with our families and our friends. For those of you watching over at the Maximum Lawyer Facebook page, for those of you who are students and professors at the USC Gould School of Law that want to add the human aspect of practicing law into your client and opposing counsel and judge relationships, get Bob's books, the Go-Giver series, and absolutely get adversaries into allies. My name is Mitch Jackson. This is the Legal Minds Mastermind. We're gonna wrap things up. Thank you, everybody, and make the rest of your day a masterpiece. Bye-bye, everybody.